But before moving forward to knuckles or network access control lists, let's understand the problem statement. I know this cannot be termed as a problem, but it's more of an enhanced security measure. When it comes to security groups, let's check the case one, where we have no access restrictions in the security group. For the inbound traffic, we have port 80 and 22, and it's allowed for all IPv4 addresses. And the same goes for outbound traffic where it has all traffic allowed as well. So the instances in our subnet with the security group as my security group can be accessed and it's a free flow of request and response. Now let's take the case two for security groups and let us remove the access for all IPs from the outgoing traffic and the outbound rules. The general logic here dictates that it should prevent the connectivity to the instances with this type of security group configurations but that's not the case, isn't it? Because the security groups are stateful and because of the property of connection tracking, if the inbound rule allows all traffics to access the network or the instance, by default, the outbound rule holds no value. And that is the reason why if we block the outbound rules, it still works. Now, let's bring in our special task force and let's place it in front of our VPC subnet just like a firewall and configure it to block all traffics from the CIDR 192.168.0.1 slash 28. And let's see what happens. And yes, it doesn't even allow the traffic to enter or reach the security group itself, even if the inbound and the outbound rules for security groups allow this IP set. That is the enhanced level of security we needed, isn't it? Let's suppose we have a target and we want to restrict it from a list of six subnets and that could be more than 25 security groups in that. So how will you restrict all that in one shot? Yes, by using a network access control list. So let's understand more about that. So what is NACL or NACL or network access control list? If I say NACL or NACL, please don't get confused. I'll be using these terms as and when it comes to my mouth. So please forgive me for that. So NACL or Network Access Control List, so it's an optional layer of security for your VPC that acts as a firewall for controlling traffic in and out of one or more subnets. So we need to understand clearly that NACL or NACL is the optional layer which works for controlling the traffic with the subnet. And security group works at the instance level and not the subnet level. So with this analogy, tell me, which takes higher precedence. Yes, you are right, it's NACL. And there are a few rules and basic concepts that we need to understand before we can use NACLs properly. So the first point is the default VPC automatically comes with a modifiable default network ACL. And by default, it allows all inbound and outbound IPv4 traffic. And the next point is you can create a custom network ACL and associate it with a subnet. With the default one that you have, if you don't want to use it or if you want to use a specific target measure, then you can create your own knuckles as well and attach that to your subnets. So that's a very good thing. And each subnet in your VPC must be associated with a network ACL, even if it allows all traffic. And yes, for the fourth point, it's yes that you can associate a network ACL with multiple subnets, but a subnet can be associated with only one network ACL at a time. Okay, so you can associate a network ACL with multiple subnets, but a subnet can be associated with only one network ACL at a time. Just as security groups have inbound rules and outbound rules, and they work on the principle of ciders or IP address and the port we can route, here the network ACLs has its numbered list of rules, and these rules are evaluated in order of the number of the rule, and the highest number that you can use for a rule is 32766. And what AWS recommends is like you can create like 100, 150, 200, 250, or you can have it like 100, 110, 120, 130 in that particular order. And it's ordered with the lowest number first. And Network ACL has separate inbound and outbound rules, and each rule can either allow or deny traffic. And this is one of the most important differences as well with security groups. The network ACLs has separate inbound and outbound rules and each rule can either allow or deny traffic. And network ACLs are stateless and I know you might want to understand what that means. We will understand that, don't worry. And you might ask me like how many network ACLs we can have 
what is the quota so per vpc you can have up to 200 knuckles and each network acl can have up to a maximum of 20 rules and this quota can be increased up to a maximum of 40 rules and this is the one way quota for a single network acl and so per vpc you can have a maximum of 200 network acls so a network acl rule contains a pool of resources that we have to add to create a network acl so let's understand that so the first one is rule number as you can see the table here all the terms that we have in the columns will be discussed here so don't worry about that so starting off with the rule number the rule are evaluated starting with the lowest number rule which means if there is a rule let's suppose 150 and it denies 443 but you have a rule with the lesser number for example 100 which allows it then the network acl would allow it considering the lowest number rule allows the request made for the 443 port and the next is type so this is the type of traffic we expect like SSH or HTTPS or HTTP or ICMP and you can also specify all traffic or a custom range. So next is protocol. This is quite simple. We can specify the protocol type uh, such as TCP and the port range we can specify the listening port or port range like 443, 2280 for HTTPS, SSH and HTTP respectively and source which is for inbound rules only the source of the incoming traffic you can specify the ip or the side of range the same goes for the destination which is for the outbound rules only the destination for the outgoing traffic so that it can be a so that can be a side of block as well and allow and deny if you wish to allow a rule you can specify allow else you can deny that now that we know what are the parts of the rules let's check how does a default rule look like so this is the default network ACL that you get when you create a new network ACL just like the security groups we have inbound and outbound rules for network ACLs if we reiterate this once again network ACL is like a firewall or security enhancement for your subnets and security groups are meant for your instances so when you create a new network ACL the default network ACL is configured to allow all traffic to flow in and out of the subnet so now let's understand how we can read the network ACL rule set. So here for both inbound and outbound, check the entries for the type of the request. Here rule number 100 that you see allows all type of traffic in and out of the subnet for all protocols and port ranges. If the source is 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 which covers all the IPv4 addresses remember to check both entries of inbound and outbound but this rule allows all the ips but in case you have ip ranges that are specified then there might be a situation that a set of ip may not match any rule set that is defined for the same reason the asterisk or the star that you see here ensures that if a packet does not match any of the ordered numbers or the other numbered rules it actually gets denied and unlike security groups, if you have a rule set that allows inbound traffic and denies outbound traffic, then it's not going to work because network ACLs are stateless. And that is the most important thing that we wanted to understand, isn't it? So unlike security groups, if you have a rule set that allows inbound traffic and denies the outbound traffic, then it is not going to work. It should be allowed both the ways, in and out. Then only the network ACLs work otherwise they don't work so that is why they are termed as stateless and along with the default NACL or network ACLs you can also customize the main network ACL as well or we can create our own network ACL for our subnets and we have to understand this point very clearly that the rule numbers in the custom network ACLs are really important and we have to understand them thoroughly so when you see the custom network ACL inbound rule, you see the column of rule numbers, isn't it? Where you see a list of numbers like 100, 110, 120, 130, 140. The only rule when adding rule numbers is that the highest number that you can use for a rule is 32766. And if you start from 100, AWS tells that it's advisable to increment it by 10 and add your rules. And the rules will be evaluated from the lowest order so what does it mean so we start from the first number then we make our way to the bottom to evaluate if the request is allowed or denied starting from the lowest number 
So it's a bit tricky, isn't it? But we have to understand this. So let's take an example here. So we have a user here that you can see who wants to access our instances over HTTPS with 443. So let's see what are the inbound rules and outbound rules for 443. So we have an entry here in the inbound rule for 443 that's on the second row which allows all the IPv4 addresses to enter the subnet with rule number 110. Now let's see the outbound rule set. We have the rule 110 here which allows outgoing traffic for HTTPS 443 from the subnet. So now let's see what happens when the request comes from. So it tries to match the rule number 100 which is HTTP 80. So we don't have a match here. Then it moves to the next higher number 110 which has HTTPS 443 allow rule set. So we have a match. Now that it has a match, it will check for the ephemeral ports and then if it allows the set of ephemeral IP block, it will move on to the outbound traffic. So the rule number 100 has no match for HTTPS in the outbound traffic. Then it moves to the next one. Rule number 110 has a match. And then it checks for the ephemeral IPs for its permission levels and if it is allowed, then you have a successful connection. But I'm sure that you might be asking a lot of questions to yourself right now and we have learned about the flow of information and the packets but you might be thinking what is a ephemeral port don't worry i haven't missed that out but before that i want you to carefully look at the rule set and observe that we don't have an allow all traffic for all ipv4 addresses and just for a moment rethink why we have allowed custom tcp for these ephemeral ports that is 32768 to 65535 and if i tell you that if i remove the rule number 120 from the outbound traffic your ports 80 and port 443 won't work so if i say this will you agree with me on this one of course you should not isn't it until and unless you watch it from your own eyes so let's understand the importance of ephemeral ports so what are ephemeral ports ephemeral in english means short-lived and here as well an ephemeral port is a short-lived transport protocol port for IP communication. It looks very short and simple, but it's not that simple. And we have to ask that if the definition tells us that it is a short-lived transport protocol port for IP communication, why is it short-lived? So these ports are short-lived because ephemeral ports are assigned on a temporary basis for making or handling requests by the operating system, that is the host. For the same reason, the client that initiates the request chooses the ephemeral port range and depending on the client's operating system, whether it is Unix or Windows or Linux or whatever it is, it assigns an IP from its ephemeral IP range. So here, as it is already mentioned for Unix or Linux or for that matter, Amazon Linux kernels, use ports 32768 to 61000. And requests which are originating from the elastic load balancing uses ports 1024 to 65535. And for the Windows operating system through Windows Server 2003 uses 1025 to 5000. And for Windows Server 2008 and later versions, they use 49152 to 65535. And the NAT gateway uses ports from 1024 to 65535. The same way actually lambda functions also use ports from 1024 to 65535. So these are their ephemeral port ranges and whenever they initiate a request they will choose one of these ports from the port ranges and they will make the request. So based on your operating system there will be an auto assignment of ephemeral ports and that's the port number that will act as a source port for the packet header. Yes that's true. I know it sounds very strange but let's see this example of what happened when a client sends an HTTPS request. So when a client makes a request with 443, the destination IP is 421210 and the destination port is 443. Remember this very carefully that the destination port is 443. Next the source IP is 32.12 dot two two dot one one obviously because it has come from the source but the source port is three two seven seven zero it's the ephemeral port not four forty three 
Remember that. And the most important thing that you need to understand is that when you make a 443 request, your source port will not be 443. Your destination port will be 443. Your communication port will be the ephemeral port. Similarly, the way the response header has the source port as 443, because it is a response, so the source port will be 443. The source IP will be 42.1.2.10 because it has come from the source. Now, as a part of the response, now the destination port will be 32770. That is the ephemeral port. And the destination IP is the one that made the request. That is 32.12.22.11. That is our client. And that's the same reason why if we don't have a rule set in our inbound or outbound rule, with all the traffic allow, we need to have a rule set for the ephemeral ports. I know this might be a bit confusing, but don't worry, we will get the clarification in the demo. But you have to remember that the most important thing that you need to understand is that when you make a 443 request, your source port will not be 443, but your destination port will be 443. Your communication port will be the ephemeral port.